it's uh, been a full journey being born here and um, coming back to talk about my experience in foster care. I just want you guys to know I'm going to take you through the dark and then I'm going to bring you into the light. And it's going to be a little bit tough going through some of these, but I know at the end that we're all going to come together and we're going to learn something. And I have a little disclaimer. Um, I'm taking you guys through my life in foster care through video files, foster care files, and diary journals that I wrote, entries in my diary. Um, so it's very raw and real, a little different than um, the speeches I usually give, and I um, just want you guys to hold on tight and go on the ride with me. By the time Kathy had been uh, murdered and I had been, you know, living in my car, I went through 18 social workers, lived in 35 different homes in and out of foster care, attended 10 schools, had gone through physical, mental, and sexual abuse, had a parent in prison, drug addiction, alcoholism, mental illness, prostitution, suicide, eating disorder, murder, and homeless and identity issues. And no one knew because this is what they saw. I had people in this community, Brevard County, that cared about me so much that my life would not be the same as it is today because when they saw I wasn't in foster care anymore, that I was struggling to strive they did everything. Next time you have a mouthy, obnoxious, lying, manipulative child, remember me. I grew up and I did something wonderful with my life and so will our children. Just have patience and kindness and empathy and compassion for them. And know that I'm here because I had supportive community. I had good loving people around me in and out of foster care and I had the fire in my belly that fed me for years. So that child that is just yelling and screaming and telling you that they know who they are and they're gonna live their life the way they want to, it's just because that fire, they can't put it out. They just don't know what to do with it. So just feed the fire, give them responsibility, let them hit those charts and they will do very, very well. And I just wanna thank you so much. And so I told my mom, I can remember at an early age, age 16, going to the Capitol, church youth trip. And as you can tell, I'm the only one in this picture that's paying attention to the senator that's giving the tour. I remember walking up to the front, um, the, front, the front fence of the White House and looking through the wrought iron bars and saying, one day I want to be on the inside. And I told my mom, Mom, I, I understand we don't have any money. I understand I don't know anybody famous or important, but I want to fly in this plane, okay? If we are to be living proof, if we are to be the change that we want to see in others, if we are to pr protect children, strengthen families, and change lives, we have to believe in the possible. I told my mom these three dreams, and I also told her that I wanted to work for the Chicago Bulls. Okay. So I said, Mom, I want to work at the White House. I want to fly in Air Force One. I want to work for the Chicago Bulls. I want to be a missionary. My first dream was to work at the White House. And this is me in the Oval Office. And if you think of 300 people, not all 300 people are always going into the Oval Office. This is me presenting the former president with a, with a personalized jersey, 43rd president, so he gets 43, right? That I got to fly with the president on Air Force One. This is us on, on the plane, on the way to Nebraska, in front of the plane in Salt Lake City, Utah. And then I, I joke with people. I don't really know where this photo was. I just needed proof I was on the plane. <laughs> and then I, I don't work for the Chicago Bulls. Uh, but what I did get to do is I came to Central Florida uh, the year that the uh, Magic went to the, to the finals against the LA Lakers. That was my first season on the job. And he said, hey, it's not always like this, so don't get used to it, right? In these trainings, the focus is understanding trauma, encouraging family engagement, and maybe even most importantly, understanding the role that all of us can play, every teacher, every parent, every juvenile justice worker. What we really need to know is that every child and youth needs one person who will be there for them and be there for them consistently. And that's what our system of care needs to provide through trauma-informed care. 
We also, over time, want to promote and maximize the sense of safety that children and youth have. We want to pay attention to the history of their experiences and the journey um, that they're on. We absolutely want to address the trauma and never shy away from it. And then it becomes very important for us to work together to coordinate the services and the initiatives to do that. Last but not least, trauma-informed child welfare and youth practice when it comes to moving trauma to strength focuses in on being able to do healthy assessment, to support and promote positive and stable relationships in the life of the child, to support and guide the family and the caregivers and all of us who are involved. And then last, but definitely not least, there's also paying attention to the stress that we sometimes feel in doing this work and making sure that we are supporting one another. So in a very uh, short amount of time, we have uh, come full circle in learning about the very best in terms of the research and evidence-informed practice that is um, available to you. I invite you to join our working committee. We would be glad to see you. I invite you uh, to come back again uh, next March as we also hold a national gathering from Wraparound where many of these ideas will be directly uh, presented. And I challenge you 